So, welcome. Welcome to the ninth edition already of AZ Nights. AZ Nights is a series of undisciplined talks. We invite guests from different disciplines in the fields of art, design and architecture who are makers, thinkers with a specific expertise or artistic practice. Um, and we bring them together to talk about one chosen theme. And um, this makes every night quite unique. We hope to get inspiration, new thoughts on trending topics in the artistic discourse and new insights on the artistic practice of the future, which is very ambitious, but we will make it, I think. So tonight the team is walking. I will walk a little bit back and forth. Um, walking like eating, breathing um, is a very basic human behavior and sometimes we do it also for pleasure. Um, and in the same time, it's so old and in the same time also contemporary if we look at the people we invite invited today. It's a quite a contemporary artistic practice. Walking can become an art, um, an educational methodology. Of course, Aristotle has it already, walking with his students to form um, thoughts and new philosophies. It's a form of reflection, well, also quite often a metaphor. Think about pilgrims, for example. And tonight we will talk to three people who put their walking shoes on for quite different reasons, also quite often for the same reasons. So I challenge you three to listen to things you don't agree with. Um, and Wiede Verknokke, he will of course draw uh, what he sees and what, <laughs> and what inspires him. My name is Katharina Smets and I'm your host of these AZ Nights. So, but first, um, I will ask you a few questions, as we do always, and uh, you can just simply raise your hand if you agree. Um, if you disagree, you don't have to do anything. But let's see, who likes to walk? Only you two, they're not. <laughs> you know, okay, but I also like to walk. Um, not really, actually. Who takes walks for inspiration? Who, uh, yeah, to clear their minds? Let's say, oh, more than half, okay. Who still gets lost sometimes? Oh, <laughs> even the professional walkers, for instance. Who refuses, like my dad, to use Google Maps or other GPS tracking devices? Oh, three people. Okay. Four, maybe. <laughs> um, who goes backpacking often? Okay, more or less <laughs> half. Um, who went on a pilgrimage, maybe for religious reasons? One person? Yes. Um, who marched for the climate or for other causes? Okay, almost half, I think. Go Good. What actually happens when we walk? I will give you a short, maybe, social-cultural overview. There has much been said, written, thought about the subject of walking. We saw a few quotes uh, already. When we walk, we are able to respond to the world and the presence and the activities of others that walk perhaps along with us. While walking, we are directly confronted with places around us, places that are outside, mostly outside of the familiar, and quite often also in motion. Thanks to this otherness outside of us, um, and, and this motion, our senses are activated. They send information to the brain, and we have to process it while walking. Um, and the body and the mind walk together. Um, thinking becomes almost a physical, rhythmic act. The passage through landscapes echoes or stimulates, stimulates the passage through a series of thoughts, as if the mind is also a landscape, um, where of some sorts where a new thought becomes also a feature in this landscape, um, or something that was there all along and that lights up. Um, thinking is a form of traveling, as assimilating new into the known that we already have. And Perhaps this is where walking is a particular utility for thinking, uh, in that sense. Uh, there are surprises, liberations, clarifications that appear by walking around the block sometimes, but also uh, around walking around the world. 
So the crucial engagement of the body and the mind, um, and then with the world and the mind with the world, of knowing the world through the body and that, yeah, and uh, the body through the world. This is not so common in a society where, well, our work quite often binds us to our desks. Um, so bodies quite often become passive and rather some kind of a burden uh, than a tool for work or travel. And people that walk quite often are aware of this pleasure um, that walking can bring to the body. And it also is, of course, beneficial for our health and the environment. Let's not forget that. Um, but there is also one more thing that our society quite often forgets to value about walking, and it is related to time. Um, the time of walking to or from a place is often reduced to a waste of time. And I think in the past centuries we tried to uh, reduce this, this waste of time that we, well, that we now well, can reduce with motorized vehicles to shorten this time as much as possible. Um, but yeah, people also try to shorten this, this waste of time with listening to podcasts, for example, like I do, or to music. Um, but let me give you one quote by Francis Alice before I introduce our speakers. In our accelerated society, the ability to appreciate this time, the use of useless, has become an intrinsically political and poetic act. So that is something we will focus on. The three speakers that we will present tonight want to validate that <coughs> wasted time in between, um, this, this wasted in between time of walking. Okay. Andy van de Vivere is our first speaker tonight. Humankind originated more or less at the same time that apes started walking on their hind legs, let's say. But the uh, history of walking as a conscious cultural act on, is only a few centuries old. Rousseau, you could say, was the first to write about walking in uh, our West Western world. And then there are, are, of course, the flaneurs in Paris. Paris, and um, they developed it as a sort of artistic project. And then there are typical walkers, for example, we know Richard Long or Marina Abramovic, uh, who walked along the Chinese wall. And there is Rebecca Solnit, who wrote her field guide of getting lost and wanderlust as well. And someone who knows a lot about paths and the people who walk them is Andy van de Vivere. He's a coordinator of uh, Trage Wege, an organization that promotes the development of walkways and slow connections in our living environments. Pathways that are not accessible by uh, motorized vehicles. And in 2012, he was the initiator of an ambitious project, Sideways, a festival along a walking track in Flanders, and he programmed interventions, and lots and lots of designers came, and he was also inviting artists and almost all important European thinkers on the topic. And he says, yeah, yeah, but I, I believe it was a big project. Tonight, we invited him to give us a taste um, of the diverse range of walking practices that exist in our world. And uh, he proposed to go a little bit beyond of our typical lists that we might have uh, to bring us instead a lesser known and more multicultural sequence of practices. And I'm very curious about that. Andy, you can walk your way up to the stage. Hello. Good evening. Now it does. Uh, good evening. So, uh, yes. I propose uh, to take you all uh, on a journey, visiting some artworks that uh, involve uh, walking. Walking as a thematic focus, or as a method or practice, or just as a random byproduct of some other artwork. Most of these artworks have taken the form of actions, live art, performances, or some site-specific projects. Um, and the most common way to document them has been through photography or video. So what I will show you is um, one slide or one video for each artwork. Just start. Here we go. This is the first one. In this one, we see the Icelandic uh, artist uh, Sigurdur Gudmundsson holding an arrow under his arm. So the arrow could be the symbol of pure practical movement, 
going from point A to point B within abstract time and space. But as the title of this action already indicates, movement or walking is not just about mobility or transport. Throughout history, the ordinary act of walking has been invested with meaning, culture, imagination and ideology, and with existential questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? This walk of the Dutch artist Bastian Ader surely has an existential power. This is the first of a series of photographs showing the artist going out by sunset to wander through the night in Los Angeles, searching everywhere with a torchlight. He wrote the lyrics of a 50s song on the photographs. Yeah, I've been searching. On the last picture of the series, he arrives at the ocean by sunrise. Anyone familiar with the tragic ending of this artist will understand the appeal of the ocean and the existential power of this ordinary walk. But Bazian Ader is actually less known for walking than for falling. He did uh, several actions where he fell down from a tree, from a bike, from a roof, etc. So we could say that he was one of the first artists that used gravity as a medium. This video work also involves a delicate balance between walking and falling. A tightrope walker moves artworks, paintings, between two highland peaks in the Caucasus Mountains. The cultural origins of the artist Tos Makasheva are in Dagestan, which is a troubled and unstable Russian republic with an ancient tradition of tightrope walking. According to the artist, the work questions the vulnerability of art and the constant precarity of artists today always balancing on the verge of appreciation and oblivion. Will the artworks make it across the tightrope or not? <coughs> In this recent five minute long single take video, the Swedish artist Clara Lieden emerges from a subway station and makes her way through the early morning streets of the financial district in New York. She walks and falls, walks and falls again, and so on. The work is called Grounding, and in psychology, to be grounded means to be down to earth, to be connected to reality, to maintain stability, to take responsibility. In our times of epidemic burnout, the slapstick choreography seems to challenge the constant pressure to be grounded and to perform. We move on, but we need to take a rest as well. We walk, but we fall as well. About 45 years earlier, the African-American artist Adrian Piper did her own grounding exercise in the same streets of New York. At the time, she was the only black female doctoral student in the Department of Philosophy at Harvard. Occasionally, she started to dress up as a person, a person she called the mythic being, which is actually her male alter ego, putting on a large Afro wig, sunglasses and a mustache, and cruising the streets of New York. <coughs> As such, she was blurring distinctions of race and gender in public space. In the 1960s and 1970s, many artists made actions, interventions and performances in public space, and especially city streets. Art was no longer about the production of art objects. They wanted to bring art closer to everyday life. On the streets of Prague, for example, Dzirzi Kovanda walked around, gently and discreetly touching passers-by, invisibly making physical contact with strangers. His minimalist actions were performed without anyone taking notice, except for the non-professional photographer who followed him, and afterwards, the people going to the gallery where the photographs of his actions were exhibited. The same invisibility is part of this rather famous piece where Vito Acconci followed a random, anonymous person in the crowd until he or she entered the private building. He did this for 23 days. The pursuit could last a few minutes or a few hours, depending on the decisions made by total strangers. And this performance somehow shows the more shady sides of urban walking and its potential, potential for su suspicion and surveillance.
Other artists don't want to blend with the crowd, but instead prefer to make a clear statement in public space. In this performance on the streets of Guatemala City, the artist dips her feet into a bowl of blood and leaves a trail of bloody footprints on her walk between the constitutional court and the seat of government. <coughs> Here, the artist walks to expose herself with all her rage and grief in memory of a bloody 36-year civil war and protesting a long series of brutal Guatemalan dictators. The piece is called, Who Can Erase the Traces? In 1998, on the day of Fidel Castro's birthday, the Cuban artist Tania Bruguera walked the streets of Havana in a suit made of dirt, glue, textile and nails. The object the work refers to is a Nkisin Conde, which is an animistic fetish sculpture originating from Africa. People can ask the fetish to grant their wishes, but in return they must make some promise. Each nail thus represents a wish and a promise. So this performance is an allegory for the social promises that were made and never kept by the Cuban government. This Japanese artist rolled through Tokyo with a crown of clothespins attached to his face. This action was part of a critique on the cultural policing that was taking place in Japan in the run-up of the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. Nineteen ninety two was the five hundred years commemoration of the so called discovery of America by Columbus, which was actually the invasion of the Americas by Europe. To protest the festivities, this artist couple walked the streets of Madrid wearing a PVC mask which covered their mouths. They took the role of the colonized and considered themselves therefore without speech. This Chinese artist has been walking a cabbage in many, many cities around the world. It's uh, the cheapest vegetable in China, and it stands for a rural culture of subsistence and hardship, which is somehow out of tune in a rapidly urbanizing world. In the wake of the Arab Spring uprisings, the Egyptian artist Heba Amin also joined the ranks of the vegetable walkers, this time with a watermelon, a symbol used in the Arab world to describe something as a joke or a deceit. This Brazilian artist has been walking around with a sign saying, what is art? What is it for? Of course, protest signs are the most obvious statements in public space. This is one of the more than 300 images of the American artist Sharon Hayes carrying different signs on different streets all over the world. Here we have the inverted statement. Actually, the sign, I am a man, dates back to the American civil rights movement in the 1960s, protesting racial discrimination. Of course, the slogan takes on different meanings according to who is holding it. Maybe a slogan and its opposite erase each other. Anyway, the Filipino artist Kiri Dalena has been digitally removing slogans from old archive photographs. These photographs were showing public protests against the censorship and the closing down of newspapers under the authoritarian president Marcos in the 70s. This work suggests how the hand of the artist can be complicit in the production of historical amnesia. Another struggle for expression in this video. In Tirana, Albania, demonstrators are carrying signboards with mirrored surfaces. The signboards reflect back on the urban environment and the distorted surroundings become the message. No mirrors here, but the character moving models of buildings in front of those same buildings. In this performance, which took about 90 minutes, the Chinese artist Lin Yilin moved an entire wall from one side to the opposite side of a busy road 
in a newly developed urban zoning one zoo. Artists not only carry vegetables, signboards, or bricks. There was Andre Cadere, known as the Stick Man, who for many years throughout the 70s walked the streets with a bizarre wooden staff, usually called a bar de bois. He seems to have made hundreds of these sticks and he carried them on the boulevards and avenues to the shops and the parks. And he also infiltrated his sticks in other people's exhibitions or galleries, becoming a parasite of the gallery system. This is the Belgian artist Tria Paquet carrying a white styrofoam ball. This is the leading figure of the Arte Povera movement, rolling a newspaper sphere through the streets of Torino in Italy. Artists have been carrying trash bags. Artists are dragging their own shoes. Artists are dragging a burning suitcase. Artists are dragging, well, each other. Here it is the Aust Austrian artist Valley Export, who is taking women's liberation to an extreme. She walked Peter Weigel, her partner in life and practice, on a leash, taking him onto the streets of Vienna, pretty much like walking the dog. This is a signature piece of the well-known Belgian uh, artist Francis Alice, who is based in Mexico. We see him pulling a little magnetized wooden dog on a leash. Thanks to the magnets, he can collect random metal pieces and leftovers on the city streets. With poetic gestures like this one, Alice want, wants to provoke new urban legends, rumors, or myths. There are all kinds of myths connected to walking. There is a passage in a book from Virginia Woolf. It's a book is called A Room of One's Own in which a male music critic is rather skeptical of the musical capacities of women. He says something like, a woman's composing music is like, a is like a dog walking on its hind legs. It's not done well, but you are surprised to find it done at all. So this quote was the starting point for uh, this rather hilarious video by the Spanish artist Cristina Lucas showing a series of remarkable dogs walking on their hind legs in small villages in Spain. The video is titled, You Too Can Walk. In the performance spinal discipline, a group of women walk elegantly with a book on their head. As such, each performer is forced into a straight, upright posture. According to the artist, these women belong to the army of beautiful women. In fact, there has been a time, for example, during the Victorian period, when young women were indeed instructed to improve their posture by balancing books on their heads while walking. You too can walk, something like that. In this piece, all performers are also wearing the ergonomic Borosano shoe, originally created in Yugoslavia in the 1960s for women in the public sector, and it was relaunched re by the artist as part of her practice under the label of Yugo Export Shoes. So here the artist draws our attention to different techniques of walking and different procedures to discipline the walking body. Shoes are probably the most important instruments or techniques for walking. For this project, the artist worked with shoemakers to create unique footwear customized for greater acoustic effects. So they adapted the shoes with special hollow heels or iron tips or elevated wooden platforms. Then the artist organized choreographed walks in which a small group of performers followed the routes through the city that were acoustically most exciting. So they found out that different spaces in fact create different sounds. Think for example of glass walls or narrow corridors, large hallways or domed ceilings. So the artist, the artist says that he treats architecture like sleeping music, which is to be awakened through the act of walking. Architecture and the built environment may be sleeping music, but they also determine where and how we can walk. 
In this project, the artist leaves the usual streets and pathways. He uses a GPS device to follow the exact line of the Greenwich Meridian from the south coast of England all the way to the coast up north. So he treats a line of longitude as if it were a real phenomenon, a path ma mapped out to follow. Of course, this line doesn't follow streets or paths. So the walker has to negotiate all kinds of ob obstacles, climbing through windows, wading through rivers, crossing properties, crawling through hedges, climbing fences, and so on. To explore uncommon spaces off the beaten track, that's also more or less what Stalker has been doing for the last 25 years. Stalker is a collective of architects, artists, and researchers based in Rome, Italy. They have developed a specific methodology of urban research based on walking, which they call transurbans. Basically, they go drifting, rambling with a group of people, and these collective walks are used as a mode of expression and a tool for mapping the city and its transformations, a tool for gathering stories, evoking memories, and so on. This is a picture I took during a public walk in Beirut, guided by the architect and artist Tony Shakar. His tours are like ambulatory lecture performances that deal with urban history, memory, and loss. The city he chronicles is characterized by contrasting fragments and ruptures, partly as a consequence of the civil war that gripped the country from 1975 to 1990. Each fragment produces its own meaning and temporality. Tony Shakar believes that the only way of producing sense and meaning, the only way to unite the fragments, is through direct experience, through the movement of our bodies in and out of every fragment. Since the 1990s and the years 2000, the growing number of artists started to organize walks, tours, and collective explorations. This means that the walking is no longer only done by the artist or by his or her performers. Instead, the audience or the spectators are invited to join in participatory walks. Very often, the artistic motives are also connected with other disciplines and agendas, such as architecture, urbanism, social design, spatial activism, critical geography, landscape design, etc. An example, not so far from here uh, in, in Köln, Colonia, is Boris Sieverts, who is guiding participants to the outskirts of the city with his urban travel agency, Bureau, Bureau für Städtereisen. This is a somewhat comparable initiative in Finland, the Romantic Geographic Society. It's a poetic construction founded in 1994 by the Finnish artist Jussi Kivi. They organize all kinds of meetings, conferences, <coughs> expeditions, picnics, explorations, and so on. Le Cercle des Marcheurs is a loose group of artist walkers uh, based in Marseille. In uh, 2013, when uh, Marseille was the European capital of culture, they were highly involved in the creation of the GR 2013, which is a long distance urban walking trail that stretches over Marseille and its outskirts. The GR 2013 was the first in a series of metropolitan <laughs> trails. So in the previous years, we've seen uh, metropolitan trails that have been developed in uh, Bordeaux, Paris, Milan, London, and also uh, Istanbul. We will hear about that later. Sometimes walking is part of a wider project. Future farmers investigate social and environmental issues through participatory art projects. Flatbread Society is one of their long-term projects in Oslo, Norway, where they started to occupy an underused common area to make an urban farm, a bakery, and a grain field. They take the issue of grains and seeds as a starting point to examine questions of food production, knowledge sharing, cultural production, politics, everyday life, etc. In uh, June 2015, they organized the soil procession, which was a ceremony that collected soil from over 50 Norwegian farms from all over the country and brought it over to Norway to be part of the Flatbread Society 
side. Here, walking is used to construct a common narrative and to tie a network of relationships between people, but also between human and non-human life forms. This is a still image from a recent video work by the Russian collective Stodelat, who are known for their highly political works. The film is the result of a summer camp where 17 young people lived and worked together for two weeks. The starting point was a manifesto written by the Zapatistas, which is a radical left-wing movement that started a revolutionary project of autonomy in the region of Chiapas in southern Mexico in 1994. The young Russians question what the message of Zapatism might be, what it means to revolt today, and what new ways of being together are possible. Walking seems to be an essential part of the camp experience and also of the film. Walking has been key as well for the Zapatistas themselves. The movement organized several grand marches all the way to the capital of Mex Mexico City. One of the famous phrases of the, of the Zapatistas is we walk, we do not run, because we are going very far. And this maybe brings us back full circle to the existential questions of the first slide. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Thank you. Thank you, Albi van Vivere. Um, if you have any questions, keep them. Uh, for a little bit later, after all the talks, you will be able to, well, we will have a discussion with the four of us, and also uh, I will be open, open for the audience. I will, um, Vida, you've been drawing. Where are we going? Yes. What have you seen during this first talk of Andy? Visions. Visions. You know, uh, yeah, I saw a lot of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Do you walk yourself, freedom? Yes, a lot. When I'm when I'm stuck with inspiration, I start. I usually do a walk of thirty minutes to an hour, and I I, I enjoy, for example, going to the market because uh, I work most of the time. I work w at home with me, mm -hmm. alone. So it's my moment of interaction also and reflection. I walk the world. You know, it was the I have no idea <laughs> the the er ergonomic uh, shoe. <laughs> It's very ergonomic, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't uh, some Francis Alice stuff. I don't think it's done like this. I don't know if dogs wanted to be walked or just want to be free. Uh, a sign holding a sign that it's not a sign is very uh, Margaret like it. Uh, what was this? <coughs> yeah, the, the, I, I found that very interesting. How walking could become sort of. Uh, Transgression, a uh, per perverted idea of following somebody. Um, you're not touching somebody, but you're following it. It's, it's an intrusive act. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. Is it is it uh, punishable by law? Uh, stalking. If you twenty three days, it was. Think it's punishable? Yeah, but he didn't follow the same person. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For twenty three days, he okay. followed. Okay, then oh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's something uh, uh, on the line of appreciation and oblivion. So, so. and uh, this was you taking us on an adventure, which you did. Uh, you took the whole stand on an adventure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Rita. Yeah, oh, I oh, still oh, got oh, one. Yes, uh, Annie, but this is you. Uh, yeah, just uh, lost in your mind with the, with the cell phone and stuff. Yes. So, so, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rita.